Hello, my name is Anna Radhakrishnan. I am a rising PGY3 at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, and I am a new Cardio Nerds Academy Fellow. Today, we will be discussing the very exciting new data from the Attribute CM trial and its new insights into this treatment of TTR cardiac amyloidosis presented recently at the 2024 International Symposium on Amyloidosis. Hi, everyone. My name is Georgia Vasilakis Satiris. I'm a rising PGY3 at UPMC in Pittsburgh, PA, and I'm a new fellow of the Cardio Nerds Academy this year. We have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Kevin Alexander, Assistant Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine today. While he sees a wide variety of advanced heart failure and transplant cases clinically, Dr. Alexander has expertise in diagnosing and treating cardiac amyloidosis, a common rare disease that is under an underdiagnosed cause of heart failure. Dr. Alexander is at the forefront of enhancing our understanding of this condition with grant support from the National Institutes of Health, the American Heart Association, and among other sources. Dr. Alexander, we are all so excited to learn from you. Uh, thanks for having me and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, so transthyreotin cardiac amyloidosis is a common quote unquote rare disease, but does comprise an estimated 13 to 19% of patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Your recent study has shed light on the molecular mechanisms underlying ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. Could you walk us through the pathogenesis behind it, as well as what we know about the risk factors for TTR instability? Uh, happy to. So transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis is an amyloid disease. So it's characterized by breakdown and misfolding and formation of insoluble amyloid fibrils. And the protein in this case is transthyretin, which is produced by the liver and normally transports thyroid hormone and retinal binding protein uh, throughout the body. It's secreted by the liver as a homotetramer, so four pieces of the protein that are similar in structure and they're closely bound together. The rate limiting step in developing amyloid is when these tetramers dissociate into monomers. And these monomers are thermodynamic unstable and have an increased propensity to misfold and to start to aggregate to form amyloid fibrils. So what some of those risk factors are for, for the dissociation, some are better understood than others. Some people are born with a point mutation in one of the amino acids of transthyretin and that can have a destabilizing effect on the protein and increase the likelihood of dissociation. But then there's other things like age and, and, and sex that probably also influence TTR stability or instability that we don't quite understand as well, the mechanism for disease. Thank you so, so much. So while we know we should be on the lookout for cardiac amyloid in the clinic and in our hospitals, how does a typical amyloidosis patient present and what is their prognosis? Yeah, I think the presentations have varied increasingly now that we have a heightened awareness in the medical community. I would say classically, it's a patient that presents with decompensated heart failure, oftentimes with a normal ejection fraction and cardiac evaluation would show some left ventricular wall thickening on echo or and or MRI. And further history would elucidate atrial fibrillation and things like carpal tunnel syndrome and lumbar spinal stenosis. Um, I think that that's a pretty common presentation as kind of an index heart failure uh, presentation. But as we start to identify patients earlier in their disease course, that initial point of contact might be new onset atrial fibrillation, or even earlier than that, um, you know, places like Cleveland Clinic are doing screening for things like carpal tunnel syndrome patients, uh, because we know that carpal tunnel syndrome often can precede cardiac manifestations by five to seven years. So there's a large variety of how patients present and to what kind of specialist they may first encounter um, with the diagnosis. And in terms of the prognosis, you know, given that this is a disease that occurs over many years, the prognosis really depends on when you find them. When we look at patients that have decompensated heart failure as that initial diagnosis, historical data would say that survival is three to four years, but that's changed rapidly as we've had new TTR therapies developed. And so it's, uh, the kind of updated numbers are still a little unanswered as we see kind of the effect of these new treatment paradigms. But for people that are diagnosed either with preclinical cardiac manifestations or even farther upstream of carpal tunnel syndrome, 
they could live a lot longer than that. Um, but again, we don't have an exact number of median survival for them. And speaking of therapies, one class of treatments for TTR amyloidosis is transthyretin stabilizers, most well known of which is the FDA approved tifamidus. So a recently studied in the attribute CM trial is acaramidus, a near complete TTR stabilizer. Could you summarize the mechanism of action of this drug and how it differs from tifamidus? Yes. Yeah, so the stabiliz TTR stabilization, as you mentioned, is the currently the only FDA-approved mechanism of action for treating ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. And really, it intervenes at the, the rate-limiting step of TTR destabilization and dissociation to monomers. And that's how tifamidus works. Acaraminus is another stabilizer that's been developed. It um, was actually developed at Stanford. And that the intent with that was to, to develop a stabilizer that has higher stabilization potency. And, and also they looked at stabilization against various TTR uh, subtypes, such as wild type and the V122I variant, which is one of the most common variants that, that we see from the hereditary side. And so in terms of comparing and tr contrasting to FAMIDIS, I think that there's a lot of uh, research going into measuring stabilization in vivo. Uh, a lot of the stabilization data we have is in, in vitro. And so I, I won't touch on kind of the differences in the degree of stabilization between the two, but I think it's a important thing to further understand as we think about uh, the treatment effects for both of these. Absolutely. So now let's dive into the attribute CM clinical trial itself. Can you help our viewers summarize the trial's methods and results? And what are some important clinical takeaways? Yeah, so this was a phase three randomized placebo controlled trial of over 600 patients with ATTR cardiomyopathy, either wild type or hereditary ATTR, uh, international study, and looked at patients randomized to acaramidus versus placebo, and they were followed over 30 months. There is the op the there is the option for patients to have treatment with tifamidus after 12 months in this study. So there was some tifamidus uh, treatment that occurred in both both arms later in the study. And the primary outcome is a composite hierarchical endpoint comprising of cardiovascular mortality, uh, cardiovascular hospitalizations, or let's say all cause mortality, cardiovascular hospitalizations, uh, change in NT pro BNP, and, and change in six minute walk. And they met their primary endpoint as well as some sub critical sub endpoints. And the composite endpoint um, was really driven by differences in mortality and cardiovascular hospitalization, so the components that we care um, much more about.